Okay, so how's everybody doing? So this tutorial is going to be on how I scratch build turnouts. Uh, in this case with uh, River Road, I'm probably going to build every, well, I will. Yeah, I'm going to build all the turnouts. So look, I just want to say before I just share about the tool part first, is there are lots of good factory made turnouts. Like I'm not advocating that this is the only way to go. This is just the way that I choose to go. And the reason why, believe it or not, like I think, I don't know when it was, 25 years ago or something, I was building a layout and I didn't have any money. <laughs> you know, at the time, I guess I was between jobs and turnouts were 25 bucks a pop. I think the Pico ones were back then, you know, they were still pretty expensive. And you, there was only a limited selection. So you were forced to build a track schematic or layout based on, you know, the few available options that there were and when I started reading up in some of the old masters books about building turnouts I thought well these guys like don't stress over curvatures and uh, turnout sizes they just plan it all in and then they just build the turnouts right in place like on the layout or or on the bench like this and then just drop them in you know you have these unique uh, you know curvatures and uh, you know, custom layout with beautiful sweeping curves, uh, space saving uh, turnouts, uh, long, you know, large turnouts for smooth transitions, you know, things like that, right? So, you know, for me, you know, it, it, it just became the go-to method, you know, uh, and I still do it to this day. And, you know, I wouldn't say that I'm, you know, an expert at it, <clears throat> excuse me. Like I still am, you know, probably not the best turnout builder, but I can build them good enough, you know, uh, and they function and they usually work perfectly. Like they're, um, you know, silky smooth, like, like that I can say, like the way they, they roll through the frogs, like if you build the frogs right and use your NMR, NMRA gauge properly, when you solder up, I mean, look at that, you know, it just, you know, beautiful, silky, smooth running turnouts. So anyway, just to quickly cover the tools that I use, you can see right here what I use. Like this is everything that I use, basically, you know, some knives, you know, basic Olfa knife, you know, uh, rail nippers of your choice, wire cutters, whatever. Uh, I like this uh, chisel head exacto blade comes in really handy then a small drill you know with small drill bits tweezers i like these sprung tweezers quite a bit because i use them to hold my rail and to pinch frog points together and so on or to hold uh, the point rail to the common rail or whatever when i'm soldering a throw bar things like that you know where you just pinch and let go you know like i say a lot of these tools i've had for so many years i don't even remember where i got them but and then a couple of nice little small files, some needle files. And then this one I use quite a bit. Uh, this, this is just a basic tool I picked up at an automotive place. I think the really small one, it's like uh, it's triangular. It's a good quality one. I do a lot of my filing of rail points and frogs with this file actually by hand. And of course you need rail of your choice. And then you need, you have to have an NMRA gauge, you know. Like even if you build over top of a template that's accurate, like if you put your NMRA gauge on the drawing and you see, okay, this is good, uh, you still need this uh, to set up your standards for your wheel flange clearances, etc. So for those of you that don't, don't use this, uh, you're going to have to learn to use it if you're going to build, you know, a, a reliable turnouts. And then for soldering, I just use 60-40. This is rosin core, I believe. Yeah. And I use soldering paste as well. Look, I know some people don't, but I do. Because you get the best solder uh, when you use soldering paste, which I clean up later with isopropyl alcohol. And uh, I tin all my PC boards. I, I, I put the paste down first. I tin over top, and then I put paste over top of that when I heat the rail up to press it down into the... PC board and then of course the Dremel cutoff tool that I love to use yes I like these thin fragile wheels the best 
the oxide ones that people complain about breaking. Look, I've been using these for over 30 years and and uh, they work fantastic. Like especially when you want to cut a small isolation gap. If you like to solder up your frog assemblies f without cutting them first and you want to cut them later on the jig. They you know, they cut a nice thin line like or gap to isolate the frog so and I wear glasses all the time so I don't worry about like if, like if they break I've never had them like they lose momentum within a few inches when they fly off the end anyway because it's so light they're so light and then I have this soldering pencil you know which I buy a new one every couple of years they're cheap I guess I should have probably bought a really nice one you know but anyway that's up to you but and then I change the tip on them maybe once or twice and then they get thrown out usually if you use enough. And then this trusty little tool here is my old Dremel disc sander which I've had for 30 years and it's never died. I took it through film. I've uh, This thing will not die and I've taken it apart, stripped it, cleaned it. I use aftermarket discs on it that I cut. You know, I just cut my own with scissors and 3M them on. And then the belts, which I have a few left kicking around, are an odd size, which I don't think you can get anymore. But I don't use them that much, really, the belt part. But I use this little disc sander all the time. Uh, not necessarily with turnouts all the time. Like when I get lazy, I use it. Like if I want to start a frog, like the angle, like initially like this, you know, right? Then I do, and then I clean them up with the hand file, so... Okay, so and then I, I custom built a welded up a, a base plate because the other one I just threw out. It was cheap aluminum cast thing, and this one's nice and rigid and square. Then I, every once in a while I'll just paint it white so I can put marks on it and so on. Okay, so those are the tools that I use. Okay, so on uh, fast tracks or handlaidtrack.com. As I mentioned before, they have free templates and they have all the supplies. Like if you want to build like number sixes or number seven turnouts, let's say, and you got to build a lot of them, then I recommend you get one of their jigs and maybe consider, you know, some of their uh, point filing tools and so on. I don't use any of those. Like I say, I use a lot of different uh, various turnouts and sizes and curvatures and so on. And sometimes I have to, I, I, I custom them as well. Um, so, you know, a jig wouldn't make sense to me. Like, unless I was doing a ladder for a yard, then I might consider it. But because I just do mostly one-offs, um, there's no point in me buying a particular jig. You know, it just it wouldn't work for me economically. So you can work right off their templates. And on their channel, like, they have, like, wooden ties, PC boards, rail. They got everything that you need. They're just fantastic company and resource for the model railroader that wants to get into scratch building turnouts. A lot of end scalers use it, like every scale they cover. O, uh, narrow gauge, like you name it, right? Probably one of the best things that's ever happened to the hobby in the 20th century or 21st century. But anyway, so here's an example of a printout of an HO scale number seven turnout. And in my case, it comes off in three pieces like this. And, they, and then they give you the little key marks, you know, where you can cut up top here. I don't know if you can see them there. They're very faint. And then you can just cut them with a straight edge, right? And then just line them up. Okay. And then I just use, you know, like tape, invisible tape, just to tape them. And then cut them out uh, to glue them onto, uh, you know, my plywood board, whatever. So I'm not really sure in this case whether I'm going to build a number seven or number six. I'm going to do both of them and then just try one and see. Like this one might be down the far end, but by the warehouse. Okay, so here I have uh, a number seven left-hand turnout template uh, in place. And I actually made, you know, a right hand and a left hand just to visually check to see how I want to see the two tracks diverge or meet up. And, and in this case, I want to keep this, like this is kind of considered the branch main right here. 
So I want to keep this as straight as possible. And then I also want to have enough room for two six axle locomotives if need be so I can do a run around at the end of, at this end of the layout. Like you have to decide that like in terms of how you want to operate. Do you want to have room here for like a switcher and two box cars or switcher and one box car, one switcher like that's up to you. You need to decide that before you fasten your track down because it can be a benefit or a curse to you later, right? Oh geez, look, you know that those long tank cars, you know the you know, doesn't, and a 50 footer and a 60 foot car doesn't fit barely, you know, so you got to think about that, right? And then you got to make a decision. I like to get away with the, as large a turnout as I can because they look more prototypical, you know. Um, I'm not a fan of, you know, number four, number fives, and I'm even a little iffy about number six. I usually like to go seven and up. But that's up to each individual, okay? So these templates are there depending on how your printer is set up and everything that come out. Sometimes on one page, depending on paper size. But a lot of times you just got to tape them up. And, uh, you know, you got to fiddle around a bit to get them. Sometimes they don't line up perfectly. But it doesn't matter because when you go to start soldering, you know, the outside rails and so on, you know, you have your gauge to, you know, to build off. Like once you get one rail soldered, you can pretty much do the next one off the one rail that you've soldered down. Like in this case, I would use a straight edge. Make sure that this rail is exactly straight. So anything you gauge off of that will, will come out, uh, you know, symmetrical and in proper form and so on, okay? Okay, so what I've done is I cut out that template now that was taped up, and I just use 3M Super 77. Uh, you could probably use craft spray or whatever, right? I just like to stick with the products that I know that work together in the method I like to use. I don't like surprises in this game, so that's why I'm set in my ways. You know, that's that's why anybody is, because they know it works and they stick with it. So, yeah, so the next thing I'm going to be doing is... Uh, preparing the PC board ties and there's something else I want to mention about why to build turnouts in a second and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about this PC board tie next okay so why bother building custom turnouts like why, why why learn to scratch build well okay so would you like if you come up with an idea for a plan let's say like here, I'll show you the one that I have for River Road okay so do you want the turnout availability prefab to dictate your layout? Like what I mean by that is, is, is that there's only so many available and it'll always be the one you need. Oh, I need that number six Y. I need that, uh, that slip switch. I need that, you know, uh, crossing, but the angle, they got all the other ones, the 45s, but they don't have a 33. Oh, darn. I need a, a, a actually not a number 12. Uh, left hand curve I need a number 10 or an 8 and so you're running around and you're trying to get some momentum on your build and you don't have the turnouts available so then the unavailability factor begins to dictate your plan and you never get to do what you really worked so hard to get like I want to stick mostly to this plan as close as I can like not centimeter for centimeter because there's obviously some revisions you know like in terms of length of where how many cars you want to fit in runarounds and so on. But the idea of this layout in terms of design was that it, there wouldn't really be any tangent track except maybe the barge approach. You know, and then maybe back here at this lead at the end of this runaround, which is going to double as a lead down to the this other warehouse industry down here or the one that runs along the back side here. Sort of doubles as an industry lead sort of thing, right? Now, this part here, like this throat here, like to be able to pull this off in, in uh, you know, two feet, like one, two, three, four, like this curvature, and then to have a easement, like to make the corner, like to have this, this, this easement type, curve with four turnouts in the middle of it 
easing back out into a more gradual, not quite tangent, but curved yard and so on. Like you're never going to be able to do it with just prefab turnouts because you're going to be forced according to the radius. And this is what I mean by when I talked about handlaidtrack.com or fast tracks and how they've been such a, you know, uh, a benefit and a blessing really to the whole hobby for people that like to design and build like this because they have such a vast array of templates and and jigs and supplies that you can learn to learn the skill and and design and build the layout of your dreams this way, right? Like I don't know if just from looking at this what exact turnouts that I need here, but I did figure out because I had to cheat this a bit that I needed a uh, you know like a number 10 or an 8, 40 by 30 radius, and then a 35 by 28, and then I had to switch them back and forth to kind of get into this corner here, you know, like this kind of thing. And that's the whole point of, of scratch building your own turnouts. Like in this case, this is a number 7, right? It looks quite large, doesn't it? But, you know, they there's the 8s, the 9, 10, 12. But, you know, like number 7s are were all the ones that I used on uh, Glover Road. And people would say, oh, it looks really cool, right? Yeah, well, the crossing and the turnouts looked really cool because they were larger, like the radiuses, right? Like the size of the turnout. They look more prototypical, especially when you're down or you're at track level. Or even from up above so that's the whole point is you can decide ah, maybe I'll go with a six here or ah, seven well maybe I'll try an eight you know this kind of thing so if you're more into the prototypical look and the high detailed vignetted sort of scenes along your shelf layout it's it's to your advantage to use larger turnouts and or build your own Okay, so you'll notice on these templates, which I also should add that uh, when you're doing a sort of a tentative layout of your plan, you can download, uh, photocopy, you know, cut up and tape up your, your paper templates and actually lay them on the layout, you know, to see what works. You know, like, again, you know, kudos to uh, handlaidtrack.com fast tracks because, you know, what a powerful tool that is to have the ability to just print off templates and try them and then when you decide okay I'm going to use this one and that other one and whatever I like this look here then you just single out those uh, track templates and you, and, and you build them and you drop them in okay so here you can see where they've indicated with the shaded ties here or the PC ties that are indicated All right that's where they go Sometimes I'll add a few, like I'll put one in the center here. I like to have one right underneath the center of the frog. Um, sometimes I'll add one here as well. I just like a little more support. Like I know with Fast Tracks, they have the, uh, you know, the laser cut uh, cross tie, you know, plates, you know, and you drop them in and spike them and everything's fine. So, but in, in the case of uh, the way I do layouts is I don't generally spike the rail unless like every now and again, like I'll, I'll use plastic ties like styrene or wood. I just don't happen to have any wooden ties now, so I'm going to use plastic. But And then I'll just spike the odd one because when they all get glued down, the ones that are spiked will also hold these larger spans. Okay, so here you can see this first PC board tie that I cut there like that. And then what I'm going to do is, is they also indicate the isolation gaps where they need to be. And you got to pay attention to them as well because here where you can see where the point stub is. There's one in between here, right? But there isn't between the frog, obviously. The frog is all powered like separately. So but there's one in between here as well because you don't want these on the same circuit. So, but, but they show you that. Like these are excellent drawings that they do. Like they really, you know, they have indications of, you know, see the gap there that you don't want to overlook, you know, on the larger paper they tell you what it is 
So I like to uh, drop my file, you know, when I need it the most, right? Um, I like to just file through the copper first, you know, like a gap. Um, probably a little bit, I mean, you don't really need to go wider than that, but I like to uh, take a little more off. Just to be safe. Okay. Just like that. See? And then what I do is I, once again, love it when I can't get the cap off when the tape is rolling. <laughs> okay, so I put a spot of CA here on the outside of the tie and then one in the middle. I just want to make sure like three points uh, to glue will work. Um, I just want to make sure that that the tie is secure because when I apply heat to it, um, you know, it's just extra insurance that the tie won't move, right? And they won't move. Like I've reheated these ties over and over again. And uh, once they're glued down, like I say, the CA will soak into the paper a bit, but it's this actual barrier that actually allows you to lift the turnout after it's built, right? If you were to glue this down straight onto, like let's say wood, and then just use an overlay or something, you know, you have trouble getting it off. But but if you do it this way, you don't need to use uh, like, like pins. Like I used to do it this way, you know, years ago. I'd use a pin to pin the rail down. Yeah, no need for that if you just, just one day I just tried this out and I decided it worked so good that I would just stay with it. Okay. And then the next, like the throw bar here, I like to leave a little extra length on the throw bar than what they indicate here. Okay. Because I can nip it off. Because sometimes you don't know too, like when you lay the turnout in, oh darn, I wish I had the longer length on this side because, you know, this is where the road is or, you know, or whatever. Um, but I don't like like I glue this in place, but this doesn't get soldered to the To the outside rail it just uh, I'll show you how I uh, Solder and pin these points to this bar. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut all these and then I'm gonna lay them all in and then out here. It doesn't indicate one, but I'm probably gonna lay one in here as well. Cause I like to build these a little bit longer. I mean, it's always nice to have extra because you know, uh, you can always cut it back or whatever to fit. You know, maybe I'll put two in there, one there, and then you know, maybe one right here. Okay. Okay, you can see all the PC board cross ties have been, or turnout ties in this case, have been. Uh, cut. Added a few. Uh, these two here. I don't know why they don't have one indicated there. Well, I guess it's because of their, their wooden template, I guess. Yeah. Uh, let me just mention at this point, you know, there's, you know, probably the, you know, fair argument, I guess, to say, well, you know, scratch field turnouts, you know, they don't look as realistic. They don't have the tie plates and, you know, the wood grain on the ties. And Okay, that's true. Um, but, you know, you do get to decide what code rail you want to use. You get to decide the size of the turnouts again at your leisure or at your choice. And if you do really, really effective uh, ties, like wooden ties or, in this case, plastic ones that are distressed, um, you know, they look pretty good. And if you know how to paint them, like if you use an airbrush and washes, and uh, they look pretty effective once they're ballasted and a bit of grass and terrain going on. Like you really can't tell. And you can, you know, blacken these ones out a little bit more with paint just to make them look like replacement ties. And so you just don't notice, you know, and then furthermore, people would say, oh, what about the solder, the, you know, the excess solder here and there, you know, you can sort of see it. Well, yeah, I guess you could if you want to, if you want to look for it, but nobody ever really does. And if you're a Proto 87 person that you really care about that, well, you're not doing it this way anyway, you know, like if you're into the proto 87 where you lay on each tie plate you know each individual one on wooden ties and you even go as far as to use photo etch spikes because you know the micro engineering micro size are just not good enough well they're more realistic by micro engineering because they're round 
you know, and then you can always add tie spikes in areas. So when the eye passes over, like it, it's, you know, I mean, that's fine, right? If you're into the, you know, you know, the more cultic aspects of the hobby in that sense, like super fidelity and, uh, you know, hyper, uh, hyper scale, you know, that's great. It's a great part of the hobby. You know, I used to be a little bit into uh, in my ON3 days, right? But, you know, that was when you did a small little shelf layout with, you know, eight feet of track or something. But you know, I wouldn't imagine doing a larger layout like that. But each to his own. If that's the way you decide to do it, then that's fine as well, you know. And then also you can also buy, you know, from companies out there like the prototypical frogs and guardrails and all that. And they look fantastic. And if that's what you're into, I mean, you can mix those into your layout as well, right? You can mix uh, prefab turnouts, scratch built turnouts, uh, fine scale turnouts, you know, Proto 87, whatever you want to do, right? But if you go Proto 87, obviously all your wheel sets change, the track gauge changes. Yeah. And the wheel sets, you know, that all looks really cool. Frankly, I like Proto 48 because it really shows well. Proto 87, you're starting to cross the line there of uh, visual fidelity in terms of uh, the distance you view it from and, and, and everything. But each to his own, you know. Okay, so I just want to talk about rail for a second here. So, um, as you know, I'm, I'm using code 70. Now, I have a whole, well, I have quite a bit of rail. I've got code 40, 50, 70, 83, bulk because when I used to scratch build turnouts back in the day I had a lot of it kicking around so I want to use a lot of it up but now if you're going to scratch build turnouts like this you're, you're better off to use non-weathered okay um, I was using weathered because I was using a lot of this for long runs like tangent and long curves handling on wooden ties so all I had to do was file and clean up the ends to solder and when you spiked it down, it was already dark and weathered. It just looked really good. But when you use this to build turnouts, you've got to file it clean, like the bottom, especially when you solder the PC ties, right? So there's a bit of filing work to do because the solder won't won't grab the weathered area because it's, you know, it's oxidized, right? So if you're in a pinch, well, like in my case, I got an old older piece of Code 70 here. Um, you know, uh, you can just pop it right you can pop this stuff off like this is like I think this is over 20 years old this uh, uh, maybe 15 years old but I'm just gonna pop this so I got some brand new um, code 70 so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use use this for building turnouts so I'll just save these ties and now this has a little bit of paint on it, but I'll just wipe it down with some isopropyl alcohol and then it'll be easier to clean up. See, it's already very clean on the bottom and so on. So now you got to be careful too. You don't get this mixed up with code 83. <laughs> I did that on one of my turnouts earlier. I, I built the points out of code 83, but I, but uh, they'll be fine because it's really, really close. But mind you, the code 70 is a nicer profile rail looks better when it's painted as well too for you know for a short line okay okay so I just want to talk uh, just for a moment about pre-tinning your your PC ties right so what I do is and I recommend it is to to smother well, well just just brush on soldering paste onto the ties where the rail is going to go first cover it in, in paste like just a small skim with the brush i do it after i've uh, tinned it as well because well i'll show you why now there's been people that have said in the past oh you don't need to use paste if you have rosin gore yes you do that's a bunch of hogwash if you don't use soldering paste you're just going to introduce carbon and foreign material into your solder joint that's how you get cold solders if you don't want a cold solder, then use soldering paste. Like, because it's an acid, it cleans, right? Well, I don't want any acid on my thing. Well, you're going to clean it with isopropyl alcohol anyway. That's what they clean all PC boards with in an isopropyl alcohol bath. So if you want a really good chrome, a high chrome solder, 
That's because it's clean. If you get a sort of a dull gray, you know it's a cold solder. It's going to fail eventually, right? It's a poor solder. So use paste all the time, right? And paste down your PC board, then, then uh, just tin like this. Look. You just touch the copper like this, and you add just a tiny bit, and you go like that. That's it. And you just go along where the rail is, and you and you do all the ties like that, right? You'll get a feel for it after a while that you don't need that much, okay? And then I clean my tip the same way, because when this 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 tip picks up slag and carbon, and when you put it back in the holder, it starts to burn off. So when you come back onto your project, you're introducing carbon and debris into your solder, like microscopic uh, dirt or carbon or slag or whatever, right? And that's so that's the whole point of soldering paste. It's an acidic medium to help increase the integrity of the solder joint, okay? Okay, so now it's time to uh, prepare some of the rail that we're going to go. And we're going to start with this first straight tangent piece, this outside rail here. Okay. Now, I've cut a piece to length a little bit longer, see? Just a little bit longer than the drawing. It's always good to make them a little bit longer so you've got a little bit of excess to cut back to fit, you know, or whatever. I like to build them a little bit longer. So you can see on the drawing here, again, this is another testimony to Fast Tracks, the excellence of their drawings. They actually show you here, you can see where the groove, like the bottom of the flange of the rail, okay? So if the rail's like this, there's the flange, let's say, sorry for the scale. <laughs> so I'm going to file away some of this on this main outside rail here. Some of this gets filed away so that the blade, the point, can butt up against it, right? So it's going to get filed. Some of this as well, this, the head of the rail, okay? So what I do is, remember how I talked earlier about these sanding blocks that, you know, that you make? Right, these are three eighths, like good quality. Like you can buy this uh, plywood, the seven ply three eighths at, at hardware stores. It usually comes in, in small pieces, like five foot or two by two or two by four. And we use that to cut your uh, sanding blocks because it'd be nice and straight, okay? And rigid. And then, uh, and then you know, they're just like, they just come in handy for so many different purposes, right? And in this case, I'm going to lay the rail where I got to cut the, you know, the groove right here where the rail is going to butt up against. Okay. I can just lay it right on here like sideways. Like it's not going to really move, right, because it's on sandpaper. So it's pretty, pretty stiff on there, you know, if you hold it down with your finger. This is the way I do it. You can get nice jigs as well, like uh, rail, rail filing jigs, you know. You know where they clamp up nice and everything too right if you're into that but just have a look on their site i'll leave a link again below and and uh and you can look at some of that if you desire to get like some of their their filing jigs and so on but i just do it the old conventional way or the way that i feel comfortable with so anyway i got that on a bit of an angle so now i just come in here with the file and i put a bit of a groove in first and then i just Take that base plate on the on the rail down, file it down for a fair distance. Like it'll show you on the drawing where you see, right? Like you just have to trial and error till you pretty much get it where you want it. It's just a very subtle filing away that you can see it there. See? Okay. And I usually just. You know, lay it on there and eyeball it. See if I'm getting in the tolerance there that I want. It's just trial and error, really. This is pretty much the easiest rail to do. 
And you want to get this one straight because you're going to use your NMRA gauge off of it when you lay all the subsequent rails, like you're going to gauge off of this one a lot. Okay. Okay, so just want to show you up close what this uh, rail looks like. The outside rail where the point pivots into, see? Which is this rail right here. Now it's very, very distinct on the drawing. If you look at it close, I don't know if it shows it here. But you can see that the taper... See, there's the notch where the point blade of the rail drops in. You don't have to file into the top of the rail, but I do a little bit, just a little bit, you know. I really take your time when you do these. Like, this is where the success of your turnout is going to be, in this area right here and in this area right here. And it just takes a little bit of practice. Like, don't worry if you mess it up. The first few times everybody does every person that builds garage built turnouts will tell you uh, that they've mucked up frogs and points right it's just the way it is i still do now and again sometimes i get a really good turnout and sometimes i get one that's not so good but even the not so good ones that i you know do I actually you know i just use them for a little siding somewhere and they work good anyway you don't even notice really but you know, there's a, you know, you get a sense of pride of doing a really nice one. And sometimes some turnouts just turn out beautiful. But it just comes with practice. Okay, so this rail here. We'll go in here. And I'll just show you this for a second. Uh, okay, see how that's filed down? See where it's almost right solid here? It's flush there. See? That's what the bottom of it should look like. And it should taper all the way up to where my thumb is. Okay, if you want a good merger, like on a larger turnout, the uh, the points, you know, butt up, you know, for a fairly long length sometimes, depending on the angle of the diverging route and so on. So, and then you see the bottom. There's a bit of a taper there. See. So you just play around with the file like that, you know, like just keep, you know, just take your time. Now you'll be really rewarded with a beautiful turnout if you just take your time, you know. Don't get frustrated because everybody messes up. Sometimes you got to throw the rail aside and start again, right? With another piece of rail sometimes. Or, or use that, you know, like if you mess this part up, then just use this section for all your other guard rails or slots. Because all this other stuff here doesn't take out much rail. There's little short pieces in here. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay. Okay, so I just want to talk to you about the principle behind this soldering method that I'm going to use. Okay, so here's a cross section of the rail and the PC board. Okay, so this is the fiberglass PC board section. This is the copper layer, this dark section. This is the solder that's already pre tinned, you can see here. And then the rail that sits on top. So what I want to do is I want to bring the soldering tip into the inside of the rail here to distribute the heat evenly. If I start down here, the copper heats up really fast, then the solder melts, and it takes a while for this rail to heat up in order to facilitate a really good weld or solder in this case. So what I want to do is just heat up the rail, that's all, and then when this gets to temperature, it melts the solder, and then it adheres to the copper with the flux as a medium of cleaning and just sucking it down in. So this rail gets pushed down flush and the solder builds a thin layer between the copper layer and the rail and it squeezes out a bit here like this. Okay, That's how you get a really good joint and that's how I do it. That way I don't have to bring like a soldering in here as well. Like holding this with one hand, solder in the other, and then I got to hold the rail in place. You need three hands, right? Okay, or 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 a jig, a, a type of jig. So I'm going to show you how I do this, okay? So it helps you so that even if you need to tweak and move the rail, you can reheat the rail up and shift the rail back and forth when you get into areas where things might be out a little bit of gauge and so on, all right? All 
Okay, so now I've got the rail ready. Okay, and I'm going to grab it with these tweezers, these sprung tweezers. I'm, frankly, I don't know where you can get these anymore. I mean, they're around. Like in this day and age, anyone should be able to find them. But you need these for sure for doing this kind of work. Okay, these pre-sprung tweezers. Probably Lee Valley Tools. I'll leave another link. They might have them or a hobby shop of some sort. Like I say, all my tools are 30 years old plus. Okay, so I want to just hold that so I can push down on the flange a bit. Okay, and I'm just going to touch the heat on the outside of the rail and let it activate the solder. And when you see it move the solder and go shiny like that, just let go. And it's in place. Okay. It's not coming off, and if you want to move it, you can reheat it. And then you do this next one. I use this, these tweezers to push down, right? Because you want it to seat down on the PC tie nice. When it heats up and melts, and then you let go. And, and once again, it's the pace that helps to, uh, helps to activate the solder, or reactivate it in this case. And then you get a nice seat. Okay, and then what I'll do is I'll just clamp this, I'll stretch this straight, run a straight edge against here if you want. You can use a ruler, whatever method you want. I like to use a straight edge or a ruler like this just to make sure it's straight all the way down. And then I like to tack this far end. Alright, just eyeball it, make sure it's all lined up nice and straight. Like that. And then heat this rail up and so on and so on and work your way down. And you get this rail in place. Okay? Okay, so there the first main rail is down. So that's just once you get the first rail down, everything starts to go nicely because now you got an anchor point, right? You can actually, you know, gauge off of everything now when you lay in these rails, like this next rail here. Well, that's a guide now, that line, really, right? So what you do is, is you just use your track gauge here, the one with the little points on it between each rail. There's a little notch right here for those of you that are unfamiliar with it. And it says track. Don't use flangeways yet. That's, that's for these guard rails. Excuse me. <clears throat> And then when you lay in this next rail, like the frog pieces, for example, you just use your grips or your tweezers again, and you lay the rail, and you hold it in place, and you just gauge off of here like this. And then you move this down to the next one, move it, move it back and forth, gauge it up tight, touch it with the soldering iron, right, and just chase it down. And that's how you get your rail down. And don't be discouraged if you go out of ways. Like I've had to move rails like three or four times sometimes. You know, I mean, that is the advantage of having a, uh, like a fast tracks jig. Generally, everything drops in and it's solid, like in terms of all the rails lining up. Whereas this way is a sort of a more freehand approach. But there's pros and cons to every method, right? Okay, so here's another angle of uh, filing the uh, outside rail for the points. This is the other side now. Okay, and there's a little bit, like you notice there's a little bit of a bend, like right about here. It's indicated here on this drawing too. Okay, you can see it there. The rail's going straight here. See how the rail goes straight to here and then right to where the notch is filed in? It's just a very slight bend as the rail starts to curve outwards. Okay. It's very subtle. It just helps that particular point to tuck into the rail easier. It's just the way that turnouts are designed that way. But, you know, I don't always do that. Like, I haven't always, but I think it's a good idea to put a little bit of a bend in there. And if you bend it too much, you can just bend it back. So, 
here's another way that I use, you know, and it's just off the cuff way to file uh, the rail where the, you can see where the point rail will sit in. Because I just take the corner again of one of my sounding balls because they won't move. Like when I put pressure on these, like these are not, like they don't slide very easily, right? Which is another reason for my multi purpose sanding blocks, you know, that I make. Okay, so I just take this and just lay this rail on the corner here, like this, and it just sort of locks in like that. Okay. And I take my file and just give it long strokes. More like pull the file more down the rail rather than going back and forth. Actually, the proper way is to pull it. The file is to pull the file across like this. But you know, we all go back and forth and you know, hack away. <laughs> anyway. That's how I get it, when you get into a rhythm and you get uh, again you want to work on that taper, a little bit of a taper along here. Okay, so now this rail started here just before the throw bar. So this one outside rail is all tacked in place or soldered. Now this is this floppy, floppy Joe, right? <laughs> uh, but I'll just chase that along, right? I'll just talk about this in a second. So I take the track gauge here, and just make sure that uh, you know it slides. You know, like a little, like a little, little bit of play here, just a little bit is okay. Right, especially in this area right here. Uh, because the point closure is going to uh, pack that out a little bit unless it's notched into the rail Perfectly so a little bit of you know play like that's okay, but generally, you know, just make sure it's engaged like that okay. And so now what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to follow this this rail drawing here and I'm going to keep uh, I've already put a slight curve in the rail. I just bend it around a coffee mug a little bit that's all I do, is I generally take a uh, coffee mug, you know, let me just zoom out a bit, okay. So when I want to put a bit of a curvature in the rail, I just take a coffee mug and I just work it around like this with my hands, just feel it, you know, and then you, know, you can always bend it back, but I just run it through like that. That's how I get my curve. You know, works, right? Cheap and cheerful. Okay, so I just want to point something out right here. So I'm starting to chase the rail down and solder each tie. Okay, see? Now, remember how I mentioned earlier about, you know, it's just tinning everything quick. And anyway, I probably should have left this. I mean, I'd rather just solder this conventionally just from the outside of it because I don't want to get any solder inside of here because you get a little bit of a bump that'll look like, uh, so here's the tie like this, let's say, on the tie plate. Well, this would be filed down probably. But you get a bit of solder buildup right here. So when the next rail, the closure rail, point blade, wants to slide up against her, you get a bit of solder in the way here, okay? When uh, this goes back and forth, all right? So you want this to be clean. So either solder from the outside right here, or you gotta get in there with a file. Sometimes I'll, I'll file just a little bit of a groove in here, like slightly, because that way when the rail is already fastened to the throw bar right here where my thumb is when that's fastened and pinned on there and then it slides across there's there's like a sort of a bit of a depression there just a slight one and so there's less resistance so it seats in nice you know anyway um 
when I was talking about this particular tie here, any tie that gets a little bit of buildup that you want to clean up, um, you can try filing it. And there's different ways you can use a rotary tool. I don't like to use a rotary tool because you can slip with them and they cause damage. And then the file, well, you can over file too and, and also file into this fiberglass PC board. That's where all the strength is. Eh? It's not in the copper, it's in the fiberglass. So I find that if you use a, you know, this good old trusty, you know, I love this blade, just the chisel head blade from Exacto. People, you know, they always have these in the stores. Nobody buys them. I don't know why, because they're one of the most used blades that I've ever had. But anyway, um, you can basically come in like a chisel and you can work away some of the solder too from the inside there nice just by just sort of chiseling it out and you can clean it up really nice there see and I was even able on this side you know to remove the copper too so if you want to remove the copper uh, you can do it with a chisel head as well if, you, if you're very careful with it but you know uh, you'll find that the fiberglass is incredibly tough on this uh, like these PC boards my goodness it's tough stuff and anyway, that's why they make for beautiful turnouts right okay so that's nice and clean in there and um, that'll you know the points will slide back and forth nicely on there and then I guess with this one here too which I did earlier which I kind of I sort of butchered it a bit I don't like doing this kind of work but oh well I got a little bit uh, antsy and I kind of, you know, messed it up a bit, but it'll be okay though. Uh, every turnout's going to turn out different. <laughs> every turnout will turn out differently. <laughs> Okay, so I just want to talk about the point blade here and uh, how I file it. Uh, usually what I do is I, I'll cut the length like just a little bit longer, maybe an eighth of an inch longer than what I need, like in this case. Um, you can see it'll go down here like this. And then it'll go up to here, up to where the frog starts. Now I tend to build these separate from the frog, like I do the points separate. Uh, you can build them all as one if you want, but I find that to be uh, a little more difficult because you got to get this bend right here where the flange, like the uh, the closure point of the frog, where the flange gap is, um, and then get the length and the curve and everything. It's a little bit more tricky to do because this is going to get cut right here anyway because the frog will be isolated if you're going to use power routed frogs. Right, if you're going to use a dead frog, well, then well, you got to insulate it anyway because the polarity will stay up either positive or negative. So you can isolate it and leave it dead with today's locomotives because they're both powered trucks and they both have pickups, right? So it'll ride right over a dead frog anyway. But I like to power route mine. So therefore, they need to be isolated anyway, just like a plastic frog or a dead frog, right? So anyway, I just like to do the point rails first and then I get this point blade established where it's going to go here. And then when it's ready, I'll just nibble off, you know, an eighth of an inch or whatever I need to, to form the gap there. So what I uh, do for the end here for the blade to the closure rail, is this the cross section of the end of the point? And I've already started this, like I just touched this on the disc sander. Like if you have a little hobby disc sander, they're quite cheap, those tools, and they're very handy to have. Um, then I'll tend to put it on the disc sander, you know, just touch it up against it and just get it started. But uh, so you want to be careful that, like, let me darken the area that you want to take out. So now let's just say that the grinding is on this side of the rail. So I basically want to take out all of this area here this all goes right 
like you file this away. So you're just left with this kind of thing. And then what I'll do is I'll I'll take down this side too a bit, like I'll remove some of that so that I get a nice blade. Like that's what the end of your point should look like. Okay. So you want to be careful too that you don't like when you're grinding, when you're removing this all this dark area, that you don't grind through here. Like that'll happen if you're not careful. Okay, so sometimes, it, like you, like like I tend to round mine off a little bit here on the bottom, um, just because it helps so so that when it butts up against the closure rail, just say this is the closure rail plane. You know, there's a little bit of gap in there just to help it to tighten up nice against. Like this now is the closure rail, right? Like in theory now that I, the, the part that you remove is, uh, this becomes your uh, cross section of your closure rail. And here's your blade point. That's what you want left on the end of, of here. And it's much easier to do by hand. I mean, you can get it started on a disc sander to get some of the bulk away. Like, it doesn't need to be all the way down. Like, just, you know, like a small section of it like that, right? Like, in this case, it's probably only about, um, you know, half an inch or so, or three quarters or an inch. And so, I like to, you know, just sort of finish that off nice you know with the hand file just to work it in nice okay and then you just tack it in place It'll be here so in this case you'll gauge off of this rail or if you want to do this one first but in this case um, because I'm soldered up to about here well, actually, right here for sure is I'll just gauge off of that and I'll start the solder and I'll solder it right there so that's engaged, right? That's the diverging route. And then once that's in place, I can solder this rail here too so, so that that's all engaged. And then it gets soldered here, but not here if you're not going to use a hinge, you see? Like that actually, like it moves fairly easily. See, like if it's just soldered to where my finger is, see what I mean? It just bends, it flexes very easily. All right. This way, you get a really nice, smooth run through on the turnout with your locomotive or cars that way. And then when it opens up, you can see the gap. There's plenty of room for the flange here, depending on where you solder the point on the throw bar. Sometimes I'll cheat it a little bit. Like you may have noticed on Glover Road, if you look close, you'll see, wow, he's got a big gap there. I just did that because I had a cheaper locomotive when I first started. I had fat wheel flanges. Okay, so refining the blade point here. So as you can see, I filed down this side that goes against the closure rail like this. And it's filed down, well, not quite vertical like that. It actually probably looks... A little bit like this. Okay, like this is taken out here too. Okay, so now I need to deal with this top of this rail, the, the rail head. So I'm just going to file some of that off so that it makes a nice blade so it closes up nice like a blade on the closure rail. So this white is what's left. Okay. So what I'll do is just on this sanding block here, so I pretty much got this side where I want it. Now I'll just turn it over like this. Okay, and I'll just hold it down. It's not going to go anywhere when it's on the sandpaper. If you hold it down, it won't slide. And then I'm just going to take this file here. And I'm just going to stroke that head, that rail head, on a bit of an angle towards the point, the blade of the point, and just... 
just flare it, just taper it just a little bit. It doesn't have to be perfectly tapered, but just you want to get the head of the rail down close to the, just the web of the blade here like that. See? So now I can lay it in there like this and I can just pinch it off to see how it closes nice. Goes against the closure rail really nice and then um, I can basically solder this now. Okay, so I just want to show you before I solder this point rail onto this turnout assembly, um, I just want to show you how I prep the uh, point blade for the throw bar ahead of time. It's just easier to do this first. So I clamp the, uh, the point in place where it's going to sit, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a little little hole, just a small little hole about 0.5 millimeter. Um, the hole is not, like it's not critical. I mean, as long as it's large enough for the brass 0.5 millimeter, which I'll show you later to go through, like I, that's coming up shortly. Okay, so now I've pretty much marked that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to... This uh, drill bit has fared me well for quite a while, so every drill I do with it is on borrowed time, I think, because uh, it's probably ready to snap this one. It's had a, a long, illustrious career filling turnouts. I'm amazed it's lasted as long as it has. So there you can see there's a, let me see if I can zoom in a bit more. So see how there's, there's a hole through there, see? It's a hole through the blade just at the web, like right, like if this is the, the base and this is the rail, let's say. So the hole goes through like that, sort of on an angle, just a small hole. And you'll see why, because I'm going to put a piece of brass wire in there. Similar to the way I did the three-way stub on the barge ramp, but not all the way through, because it's not a pivot point. It's fixed, soldered. But the brass rod will actually help it with the solder. will actually anchor this blade to the throw bar so that it can take the pounding, you know, thousands of times or, how, or however many times, uh, you know, you're moving this back and forth. Otherwise, um, I don't know what the percentage is, but there is a failure rate associated with uh, points uh, that are soldered to a th to a throw bar when it's just solder. I mean, they're pretty good, but you know that's something that you don't want to have happen because it'll happen on your favorite part of the layout or in an area you know uh, that is most inconvenient, and then it's very troublesome to to re and re it the same way because you got to strip the paint away and clean it up and re-solder it and it's you know just painful but okay okay so I'm starting to solder this point rail in and I begin here on this turnout right not this one because this is for the hinge point and the reason for that is is, is just gaining a little more leverage so it flexes better see Rather than being fixed there, it would be a little bit tighter, but you could probably even get away with that too. I think I've done it before, but anyway, we'll go with this one. And so we get the, the NMRA gauge out, right? And we check gauge, track. 
see these two notches again sorry for those that already know this but and just make sure that it passes through there that like no binding it just you know snug with a tiny just a tiny hair of play I like just because it's different wheel sets and so on but anyway and then I go to the next one here like this okay which is sitting pretty good engaged there and I'm gonna grab it with this because it's hard on the fingers it gets hot just double check that okay heat the outside of the rail only and wait just just press down and wait till the see there the solder activates and goes like chrome polish that's a good solder there you go okay Okay, so I just want to talk about the frog here. So there's many ways to do frogs, you know, like probably about as many ways to lay up a frog as there is personalities. <laughs> anyway, um, some, okay, so this way here is what I've done here is I've just treated it similar to the points. Remember how I did the points? I just grind them down and flare them and I just mate them together. And sometimes I'll just put them on a piece of wood, put a weight on it. You know, and then I'll just smother it with paste, right? Soldering paste, just put a big blob on there and then heat it up with the soldering iron and then just dribble in some solder. And then when it's soldered and solid, I just file it up. I clean it up and then just drop it into place and let the tail overrun the turnout and then cut it off later, right? That's a pretty easy way to do it for me. Uh, this way you can trial and error it. I mean, there are sort of more technical ways of doing it that I used to do it, but it, you know, they're more fiddly. Like, for example, you can take the rail, like let's just say this is the top of the rail here. And, and then you, you know, bend the rail like this, I'll exaggerate it a bit. Right, you bend the end of the rail first, and then you just file this down. Like you file that off. So you've already got a taper right there. And this gets the outside of the frog sort of, and then you just run another piece in like that and then file it off, right? Like you can do frogs that way. But in this case, I just treated them both like points and then just eyeballed it until I like it. And even if there's a bit of a, like even if I do it this way, like just to say this is the frog here and then, you know, here's part of the rail. And there's a bit of a gap right here all right like that's exaggeration there i just fill that with solder you know i don't worry about it. just web web it in with a bit of solder and then once it's soldered nice with lots of flooded with paste and a good uh, like a good weld let's say then i just clean it all up with a file like in my hand just tweak it all up and file it up and clean it up nice you know just make sure that the angle of these two rails is very close as close as you can get it you know before you solder it up right and then once you got it soldered up you just lay it in and you just gauge it off the the main rail again like this side right it's the main rail you just gauge it and then when it runs across to this rail see this is really a nice gauge now this rail um, so when I come, come on like that, you just make sure that it just clears the point so it doesn't catch the tip, but it just clears it within the gauge. So you know you're in there. And then, then you can solder that. You can tack solder it in place, basically. And then you can come on this side. Remember how I left this rail loose here? A little bit loose, see? I can push it in and it just falls into gauge real nice. So you can do it that way if you want. And there's other ways, like I used to do larger, like garden rail, brass, and, and uh, you know, larger narrow gauge and code 100 and stuff like that's a lot easier because it's got a bigger profile and it's easier to work with. But uh, you just got to play around again, like just practice, like file, you know, leave some excess for mistakes, right? Like overrun, remember, overrun, overrun, <laughs> overrun. And, uh, you know, just practice and just sand both like I touched these on the disc sander and then I just touched them up with a file you know 
just give them a nice couple of nice passes. Just play around till you do a few dry runs till you like the look of it. All right, that looks pretty good. You know, for the angle, roughly I'll just eyeball it from here. But you know, I'm going to settle for that, and I'm going to solder that and drop it in. You know, that looks pretty good, I think. Okay, so so I got the uh, frog rail set up here, pinched off with the tweezers. All right, there's a little bit of a gap there, but that's okay. I mean, it's not a perfect angle. It doesn't have to be. Like I said, we're going to fill it with solder. And then I got a weight on here, just holding it down with the sounding block. And then what I did was, is I just took a measurement off the drawing. So 30 millimeters roughly. Like nothing, you know, you don't have to be perfect. Just 30 millimeters out was just a random number from the tip of the frog to 30 mil. And then I measured off the drawing what the rail spacing was, and it was about 5 millimeters. So that's what I have here, okay? Very similar, because it's so close... Uh, that uh, you'll be able to tweak it uh, once it's in place, okay? So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to heat that up and I'm going to flood it with some solder, okay? Like I say, I used to do frogs more technical, kind of notching and, you know, the bending. I, I just, I got tired of it. I just, I'm lazy. I'm a lazy modeler now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm committed, obviously, but I, but just with my method and everything, I did kind of like to cheat. Like when you get old, you <laughs> you know, we, st we tend to cheat, you know, like cheat method, right? Cheat the method <laughs> to, uh, you know, get all the... You know, if the part's unnecessary, delete it. <laughs> anyway, so that looks pretty good, right? I'll lift that off of there. There we're getting there, right? Okay, so I got the frog in place. I got it weighted down with my sanding blocks and a good old trusty heavyweight. By the way, every modeler should try to get something, a tie plate or, or, or a big piece of steel or something because they're, they're invaluable. I've had this thing for years. My little brother gave it to me when he used to weld frogs for Great Northern. Uh, many years ago, he was a manganese welder and he gave me this and I've had it ever since and I just love it. Um, anyway, let me just zoom in a bit here. Okay, so I got it in place, and uh, as you can see, it's it's it sticks up a bit, but that's okay because of the weight here. But uh, I'm going to push it down when I activate the solder. So I got the gauge on there, so off the main tangent rail, I want to make sure that I clear the frog there. Okay, this side I'm not too concerned about yet even though it matches up really well because this rail's not soldered yet and I can tweak it a millimeter or two either way, so, okay. So I did get a little tiny bit of movement there. Excuse me. Uh, oh, that's pretty good. Oh, that's really good. See there? It's right engage. 
and then this side she's right in gauge just move that rail see that's not soldered so I'll just solder that rail in place uh. yeah I like that Okay, so I gotta make a bend there. So I just put it in my needle nose pliers like this, let the flange flush on the bottom. Some needle nose. Okay. And then just give it a little tweak bend like that. Like I say, I make these a little bit larger than uh, what is required because that way I can grind them down a bit. And you just measure it off, just eyeball it in off the drawing. This one needs more. These are the frog guard rails. Now they're an extension of this point rail too, right? Okay, so they run a ways yet along this rail, the wheel before it catches the frog see and it rides along this offset angle too for a while and then catches the frog so it looks like it's a big gap to jump but once they're in place though they roll over quite smoothly yeah. That's how those go in. And then once again, uh, you do gauge, like off this guardrail here, I'll show you. Let me just hold it in place with these tweezers here. Like that. These are, uh, you gotta have a set of these. Like these, this is your third hand. Like these are so important because the rail, you're dealing with hot rail. So, you know, your fingers, unless you got elephant skin, um, you're gonna burn yourself. So, yeah, so when that gets, oh, did I not solder that? Oh, look at that. I didn't even solder that yet. Oh. See, so that'll run along there. You want to make sure that part, like that little return bend there is still engaged. Eh? It's not as crucial on this end because it's just a guard rail that, so when that gets soldered in place, you just double check that and make sure that that's, and it rides right over the to the frog there like that, see? Okie dokie. Get those set up. So this guard rail is uh, cut to the proper length here. So now this, they don't get a bend on the little end here, but they do get a little bit of a chamfer. And just in case the wheel catches, uh, there's just a small file chamfer here that it shows uh, on the drawing so I just do that by hand with a few strokes just in case the wheel catches there the flange you know it'll just guide it through the the guardrail there and again when I solder these in I'll come in the solder on the outside here and touch on this rail holding it down with these until it activates and it, it just sort of like when you do it this way too it just pops like it just sort of 
like once the solder activates, it just squeezes out of the way and, and grabs the flange, which is really nice. Yeah. That one looks really good. So that one's done. And this one here is probably too long as well. Yeah, a little bit. I can just touch that up. I can just touch that up on the disc sander. Like I said, I don't use the disc sounder a lot, but boy, does it ever come in handy for tweaking uh, the rail like this, because, you know, it's pretty tough stuff, eh? Okay, so those guard rails are done. And then I got these two pieces here I'll just do for the outside. And they got a little bit of a bend on each end, the guard rails, to pull the wheels. Um, these actual guard rails are really important to ensure that the flange rides inside the frog here even though it should anyway but it's just an extra insurance that the wheel won't catch the point of the frog and, and derail okay and that's what these are for these guardrails and again they're according to the uh, flangeways on the NMRA gauge as long as everything meets the NMRA gauge for track distance on the inside of the railhead and the flangeways uh, you're pretty you're fairly good to go okay okay so this guard rail is in as you can see from this cut point here actually I'm probably a little bit too tight there but I'll just clean that out with the uh, cutoff wheel with the Dremel um, you'll see where the diverging point is right here so the other one has to match this it doesn't have to be perfect but like this one when this one goes in uh, there will be a flange way gap there as well. See? Passes through nice. Then you can see on this side already, like it looks like a big gap there, right? But look at this, watch. See that? Isn't that real nice? Wouldn't even know there was a gap there. That's because when the wheel comes off the frog, the outside of this, the, the, the shoulder on the tread catches this angle, guardrail here first, it, be, long before it picks up on the gauge. See, watch. See? So there's no bumpity bump. Doesn't take much solder, you know. I probably use too much solder. I'll, I'll confess that I probably need a lighter touch on uh, my soldering jobs. But hey, man, nobody has it all, right? We're not all. We all do certain things well, and then other things not so well, right? But we get by. We do them anyway because the more we do them, the better we get at it. So we work on the things that we're not so good. Okay, so we're almost there. So now the points to the throw bar. 
I remember how I uh, explained earlier on how this is the end of the point here. Well, this would be cut off right here, this part of the flange. And so with this and this, right? So this is the blade end of the point, the very point right here. So I've drilled a hole in there, right? And then I'm going to run this brass, like just like this little brass here, which is, uh, I'll show you what that is. That's this stuff right here by KNS number 9860.5 millimeter brass rod. Okay. I just cut a longer piece. You know, make sure you knock a little, you know, if you cut it with nippers, that you knock a bit of the, the burr off the end so it goes into the hole depending on the size of the hole that you drilled it's close enough it'll go in so this I'll, I'll enlarge this for the purposes of the video so this uh, brass rod that goes through like that it goes through the rail and then down in through the tie push bar or sorry the throw bar into the wood, I drilled deep into the wood away so it can go down in there a ways. It's just going to pop anyway. So there it is. You can see it's hooked on there. See? So I'll just put a touch of solder there and I'll do the other side like that. And it's locked in good, soldered good. part you want to be careful you don't want to put too much solder you'll solder the point to the to the outside rail but if you push it down tight it should be okay so there you go it's done the points are done and then um, we'll just soak this down with isopropyl alcohol and uh, Let's just double check. Okay, that's done. Points are done. Points are done. Insulated, 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 insulated. It's all insulated. Ah, okay, so I got a cut right here. See, I got a cut through right here. I'm gonna isolate the frog, okay? Okay, so this turnout is pretty much built, and then what I do is, and I may have shown it in some of my other clips, but I'll do it anyways, I just soak, soak her down with 99% uh, isopropyl alcohol. That'll strip and clean this turnout. Uh, squeaky clean it'll eat all the flux off the solder joints and uh, help release it'll help release the uh, paper from the wood Okay, so this is soaked for quite a while now, and you can, oh, look at that, it just comes up just like butter. See that? Look, yeah, that's the way. The longer you wait, the better it is, because then you don't have to clean up the plywood if you, the paper should lift right off. Oh, yeah, that came up nice. Oh, nice, it's all ready. It's all ready for uh, another one, right?
Okay, so I just want to show you how I finished the turnout now in the specs for microengineering track, for example. Since I'm using microengineering flex track, this is the tie right here. This is the height of the tie. And uh, this uh, product right here, number 155, 60 thou by 100, is exactly the, pretty much anyway, the profile of these ties. Okay? And then in order to pack out these PC ties to the thickness of this tie, I use uh, HO scale 4x10s just to add to the bottom. So all I'll do here is, uh, first of all I scribe them, right? I, I, I scribe the whole strip, remember how I told you how about grain distressing? Well make sure that the bottom of the rail, like when you do any soldering as well, that, that it's sanded or filed, like roughed up the surface, that way you get a really good solder and, and, and bond, right? The same as glue with any material. Put a texture on it, like a, a tooth on it, and it, it grabs really good. And uh, especially when you do that with plastic with and, and metal uh, with CA, it'll just grab, because it's mechanical bond, right? Okay, like it's not a chemical bond like this, like solvent is. It's like this, CA. It's not a chemical bond, so when you have like rough teeth like that, and then on the other surfaces rough teeth like that, you're going to get a good bond with CA. If it's smooth like that, it just won't be as good, okay? So, yeah, so what I do is I just take a bit of CA. So, for, for example, on the uh, ties that are already in place, because they're quite a bit thinner than the actual scale tie, right? So I just take the uh, HO 4x10, which is this one here, and uh, just CA them on the bottom, like so. So by doing this, you bring... Uh, the tie up to the height of the you know the scale ties that you're going to glue in and you leave the throw bar as it is because you want a space underneath it so when the throw bar goes back and forth you know it doesn't have to slide on anything okay like so so by doing this you bring uh, the tie up to the height of the you know the scale ties that you're going to glue in and you leave the throw bar as it is because you want a space underneath it so when the throw bar goes back and forth you know it doesn't have to slide on anything okay okay so just to finish up this turnout with the plastic ties uh, I don't know if I mentioned this uh, number 155 which is 60 thou by 100 thou, which is as close as it gets to the microengineering tie. Um, so I just cut the ties. I just uh, chase these ties all the way down. I don't measure them off the plan. I just eyeball them all in at this point. But um, So I just find it easiest to, to turn the turnout upside down. Put a B to C A. along and then just lay it in like this so these have been scribed with the razor saw right remember how I showed before for doing deck planks and then it leaves a nice random scribe mark so when you paint these and put a wash on them like uh, oil wash or whatever when you paint this as a model then they they end up looking pretty good you know and you can trim and mask off and re airbrush the rail rust whatever I'll probably do a demo on that as well but now let me just say this too in closing that uh, 
So when this is all dry, so when I glue this actual turnout down in place on the substrate roadbed of your choice, whatever it is, whatever method of glue you use, um, I'll spike the odd tie, like every fifth tie or so, uh, in between the PC ties, I'll actually spike, like pre-drill if I have to, and, and, and put a small spike on the outside of the rail on every random tie or so, just so that those particular ties that are glued down, like I'll show you here with this other turnout. I'll just zoom out for a second. So like with this one here, when this gets glued down into place, okay, then I'll just put a spike in here, here, one here, one there, and so on. Just, just a few spikes here and there, because once those are spiked down and the ties are glued down to the cork or substrate, then it'll hold the rest of them in place. Like it's not going to move, and then when it's ballasted, you know, it's as good as it gets, okay? So they look pretty good, you know, like minus the tie plate spike effect. Uh, if that matters to you, then you'll just have to stick to default turnouts. But uh, when you're doing this kind of a layout, um, you're going to require custom-made turnouts. And that's why I do them this way. And I like them. They just look better overall. And they, they run nicer, too. They run really smooth. They look prototypical. So I hope you all benefit from something from that. Um, it takes a while to do, you know, to demonstrate something like this, obviously, but it's part of what's going into River Road. So I appreciate you all tuning in. I thank you for watching. And um, we'll see you on the next upload, okay? Cheers.